Is my mic on? Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been uh, promising this talk for a year and a half, Mike. Yes. And uh, the Mormon Battalion was one of the most unusual, unique military units ever to serve in the United States Army. And their service was during the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848. It's the only military unit to be recruited totally from a religious organization. Uh, that organization, of course, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as the Mormons. Um, why was it formed? What larger unit was it a part of? And what was its mission? And what was its impact on the war and on Western expansion in the United States and the American Far West? We'll explore the roles uh, the members of the battalion played uh, in many major historic events related to the 1849 California Gold Rush. And finally, we'll examine the involvement of many of the former battalion members in the establishment of settlements throughout the Great Basin and the, far, uh, the American Far West. And many of those uh, settlements uh, prove that the uh, Great Basin, although I can't remember, was it Fremont who referred to it as a great American desert and where nothing would grow, proved him wrong. So to understand why the United States military would recruit solely from a, a religious organization, we need to step back and look a little bit about what was going on with the Mormon church. Uh, the church, uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was founded by Joseph Smith in 1830 in Palmyra, New York. And it was, uh, it was during a period called the Second Great Awakening, which was a religious revival all along the northeastern part of the United States. So a lot of people were open to new religions and any religion. And so Joseph Smith was very successful in, in starting the church, and it grew rapidly. Um, so make sure I got this right. Okay, this is Joseph Smith. Um, he, he uh, formed the church, and it spread very quickly from, let's see which one we're on here. Oh, this is not Mike. Where's Mike? <laughs> you, Mike. My slides aren't working. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go with this until Mike comes back. Okay. It formed up here and in New York State, and then it spread. Uh, he sent missionaries out to, to proselyte, and it spread quickly. And one of the groups he sent was out to Missouri. Oh, it's up here. All right. So you can see, um, you see, it was in Missouri, and he came out to Missouri, and a lot of the Mormons started settling in Missouri. Uh, so many, and because the church was a, a collective body who, who practiced sort of a, uh, a common, a res applying common resources, they pooled their money and bought large tracts of land and stayed kind of to themselves. And as more and more Mormons moved in uh, to the area, there are conflicts arose between the people that were already there and the Mormons that came in. The people there viewed them as a, a cliquish, um, abolitionist type of people. And their cultural mores and behaviors were quite different, which caused a lot of contention between the two groups. And as more and more Mormons moved in, they, uh, the people became more and more concerned that the Mormons were going to take over. Being abolitionists, they thought that they would push out the people who were slaveholders. And so there was a lot of tension, and it escalated. And finally, there were conflicts and uh, actually battles between Mormons and non-Mormons. And finally, in 1838, Governor Lilliburn Boggs issued an order called the extermination order that said that the Mormons were to be were a uh, blight upon the, the state and that they needed to be pushed out or executed for the for the welfare of the state so he initiated that uh, that order and the state militia to, uh, drove the Mormons from their properties in the winter time and they drove them and the Mormons took flight into Iowa and Illinois. In Illinois, they established a new city along the Mississippi River. It's at the bend of the Mississippi up near across from uh, Keokuk, Iowa. 
Uh, and it should be like right here. You can see it on my map here. And they set it up in 1839 to 1844. The city grew very quickly because of all the converts that were coming in from Europe and across the eastern parts of the United States. By 1844, there were between 11,000 and 14,000 Mormons in that city. It was the largest city in the West. And of course, being close-knit, they were taking a lot of businesses from other uh, towns along the Mississippi River, and so there was more contention. And then the people who drove them out of Missouri started creating trouble for them in Illinois. And uh, things were relatively peaceful until 1844, when a mob attacked the jail that Joseph Smith and his brother were being held in on charges of sedition, which is a, another story related to a, a printing press that he had destroyed. But anyway, they attacked the jail. Joseph and his brother Hiram, who was the patriarch of the church, were murdered. And the people who perpetrated that believed that by killing the leaders, that the church would die. And so it didn't. Brigham Young um, was the next leader of the church. And he continued to deal with the persecutions and the burnings of the farms and, and murderings and, and uh, um, rapes of the women in the outlying areas. And so finally, he petitioned the federal government and the state government for help and redress, but none ever came. And so they, because they were not getting any help, uh, the Mormons and the governments talked and the government said, well, maybe you guys should probably leave the states for the general welfare of the public. And so Brigham Young said, in a, by 1845, Brigham Young said, okay, we're going to leave. We'll leave in the spring of 1846. But at the same time, he's told his members of the church to prepare to leave before the spring so as to prevent uh, any interference from the federal government. So the Mormons continued to prepare to leave at the same time mob pressures increased on, on, the, uh, on the city of Nauvoo. And they kept coming in and coming in. And finally, in February 4th of 1846, the Mormons started to leave um, Illinois and their trek west. As you can see in the map, Get the right size here. Well, they're not, the slides aren't changing, Mike. Okay. I think Mike needs to stay in the room for me. All right. So the Mormons were spread out across <coughs> Iowa. Um, through here. Okay. And, and what happened, they were destitute. Many of them <coughs> were forced to leave only what they could put in a wagon. Oh, it's back up. Okay. <laughs> So they, they left Nauvoo, and they're spread out right along here. And so they have n virtually no food. It's winter out. They're living in wagons and makeshift tents all across, across Iowa. Now, Brigham Young had planned on getting the saints to the Rocky Mountains. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and some of the leaders had talked about getting them to the Rocky Mountains uh, because nobody was there. They didn't know exactly where they were going, but they wanted to get there. But because of the, the terrible condition and the lack of food and people still in the city being persecuted, Brigham Young decided that they would set up a camp, a temporary camp at uh, winter quarters on the other side of the Missouri River in Nebraska. And they would stay there and try to reorganize and regroup during 46 and move on uh, n the following year. However, while they were on the trail, this occurred. The Mexican-American War started, and <clears throat> Brigham Young looked at this uh, event as an opportunity for the church. Uh, he sent James K. Polk, who was president at the time, and other politicians were concerned where the Mormons would end up. Because they've been treated in the 16-year history of their church, they've been run out of four different states. And at this time, the United States had just made an agreement with Canada 
to open up the Oregon Territory as part of the United States. Uh, the slides are not coming up right, Mike. Well, are you pressing it? I'm pressing the next button. Yeah, why don't you come up here and help me out here, Mike. <laughs> okay. That's not the right one. Okay. I'm pushing this button right there. Right, that should move it forward. Okay, maybe I'm not pushing it hard enough. Yeah, that could be it. Okay. Is that where you want to be? That's where I want to be right now. Okay. Okay. So, push so, once and push all the way down. Okay. Uh, so, Paul, see, it didn't come up. Technology is great when it works. Yeah. Okay, you want to go forward? Right. See? Okay. See, it's not up there. It's on my screen. Oh, that's intriguing. Yeah, so it's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, see, it oh, it's got to come up. It's so a little slow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Probably because we're wireless. Okay. Very cool. Stay right there, Mike. <laughs> okay. So they're concerned. Uh, the Amer uh, the government was concerned because of the way they had just treated the Mormons, and they're spread out all over the West here, and Oregon had just been uh, settled. So they were concerned that maybe the, the Mormons would throw in with the Brits, with the Mexicans down in Texas. Or, um, and so they weren't sure what to do. So Brigham Young was aware of this. So he sent two emissaries to, uh, to uh, Washington, D.C. Just push it once. Okay. I did. I think. Huh. Did it show up on here? No, it did. It's not the right thing. Well, that's intriguing. I didn't run into that. Well, okay, but don't keep moving. Okay, I'm trying to get back to where I am, okay? So I don't know why the slides aren't working. All right, so anyway, I'm going to go without these, and I'll try to get them up there. Well, here. Okay. Let Maybe Mike can run it while I, I talk. All right, he has magic fingers. Probably not. Okay. Okay, that's Thomas Kane. So what Brigham Young suggested to the feds, he had Thomas Kane and a, a member named Jesse Little from the eastern United States approach Polk and ask to tell him that uh, the Mormons would uh, provide 1,000 volunteers to build a series of forts up to Oregon to protect the immigrants that were now moving up there in mass in the 1840s. And that's when the government was concerned about the Mormons thousand Mormons running around out here with guns. And uh, so they said, no, that's not a good idea. Um, some others in the government believe that they should do it because they believe because of the, the terrible way the Mormon men had been treated that they would not volunteer at all. And if they didn't volunteer, then that would be justification for the army to come and destroy the church once and for all. So Brigham Young offered a compromise. They reached a compromise. The church and the government uh, would get, uh, would, the church would provide the government with 500 volunteers. Um, skeptics in Washington were comfortable with this because they figured the army could probably take care of 500 men if the Mormons reneged on their promise to behave themselves. And what the church got in, in reply, next slide, Mike. Take. Okay, all right. So what the, the church gets out of this, the army gets 500 volunteers, but the church would receive permission to temporarily establish a number of way stations through Iowa, which was technically Indian territory. Uh, they would also, did it come up yet? No. It didn't. Okay. The church would also get 500 men, some of their family, have their way paid to California, and at the time, California was considered anything west of Missouri, the ultimate California. Okay, these are the benefits. So that would be, uh, they would get out there at government expense. The money the government would have spent on providing uniforms for the battalion could be given to the church members who in turn would give it to the church leaders to provide relief for all the, way, uh, the immigrants that were stuck out on the, across Iowa and still in Nauvoo. So they got a lot of money because the Mormon battalion did not receive uniforms, but they got a uniform allowance. Soldiers also agreed to give part of their salary in addition to paying a 10% tithing to the church for relief efforts of the, of the Mormons uh, that were still on the trail. And finally, it would uh, establish, it would demonstrate an allegiance 
by the Mormons to the United States, uh, eliminating any suspicions about Mormon loyalty to the government. Okay, the church members knew nothing about this agreement uh, between church leaders and the government. So that they were very surprised when on June 19th, 19, 1846, next slide, Mike, uh, Captain James Allen of the 1st U.S. Dragoons and four of his men arrived at the Mormon station at Mount Pishka, Iowa. Now suspicions ran really high that the soldiers were there to spy on the Mormons to count the number of people in preparation for an attack on them. Okay, it's up there now. Okay, um, next one, yeah, go to the next one. Well, it'll take some time. Okay, so they were really, really surprised when they found out that Allen was in the camp to recruit 500 of their men to go fight for the government that just pushed them out of the fourth state they lived in. One of this, this, this content, they were angry, and this discontent was captured by one of the, uh, the Mormon refugees whose name was Henry Bigler. Um, he wrote this in his journal, quote, this made up from the camp of Latter-day Saints just after the expulsion from their homes to then cap the climax the government would call for 500 of our best men to go and fight their battles. Here we were, the saints with their wives and children in Indian country, surrounded by savages without house and scanty supply of provisions to leave them thus to go to the call of our country to say the least was rather trying." End quote. So that was the general sentiment throughout all the camps across Iowa. Now to counter, next one Mike, yeah. Yeah. okay. So to counter this, Brigham Young and some of the church leaders uh, visited every camp across Iowa, explained the benefits of the enlistment to the Mormons, and um, within two weeks, they had 500 men volunteered. Now, unlike other volunteer units organized during this period, whose officers and non-commissioned officers were selected by the, the enlisted men, uh, all the uh, Mormon volunteers agreed to have Brigham Young and the church leaders uh, select uh, the officers. In addition to the men, there were 33 women, 20 of whom signed on as laundresses, 61 children, and a number of dependents um, were also part of the Mormon battalion when they marched out of Council Bluffs. Okay, yeah, um, yeah keep it right there, all right? We're on track here. All the, uh, all the Mormon officers agreed that while in the field, it would be of great benefit to have a, um, the ultimate responsibility for the command go to a regular army officer rather than a Mormon officer because Mormon, uh, regular army officers were able to write bills of credit and get supplies for the soldiers that a Mormon officer would not be able to do. So they agreed to uh, let current Captain Allen uh, serve in that capacity. Several other non-Mormon uh, regular army officers would also serve the battalion uh, during their year of service. Once the battalion was formed, this will give you a picture of what, the, uh, what they look like. It's not a slide yet, Mike. Individuals that had, these were individuals that had been living in the open for six months. Many were destitute, driven from their homes, had little or no knowledge of any reg army regulations, our marching experience, and most certainly had no desire to become soldiers. These volunteers had viewed their enlistment as a mission for the church, given their allegiance first to the church and second to their army officers. They were not marching to California to conquer uh, it for America's desire to fulfill manifest destiny. Uh, they, they were involved because they viewed their involvement as building up of the kingdom of God. The battalion was comprised of men representing various occupations and backgrounds. They ranged in age from 14 to 68. Many were volunteers, uh, were from uh, foreign nations, Sweden, Norway, Wales, Ireland, Germany, and the greatest number coming them from England. They were a lot of converts that had come to the United States. 
Um, all the existing states were represented in the battalion except for Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. Next slide, Mike. Okay. You got it. okay. Despite the fact that the battalion was totally formed from a religious uh, body, it was authorized and formed as part of the U.S. Army structure with specific goals. On 13 May 1846, Congress authorized uh, the Army to raise 50,000 volunteers to serve for a, per a period of 12 months to supplement the Rio Army. At the time of the Mexican War, I think the authorized strength for the United States Army was five or 6,000, yeah. or 8,000, and they only had 5,000 men in the ranks. And they knew they had to have a lot more men to be able to wage a war against Mexico. So during the war, Mexican War, a group of companies formed a specific task. Uh, this was a battalion, uh, the definition of a battalion within the Army of West was it was a group of companies formed for a specific task, but disbanded when that task was finished. Each company in the Mormon Battalion met its authorized strength of between 80 and 100 enlisted men uh, and was commanded by one captain, three lieutenants, and a number of non-commissioned officers, comprising five companies for a total of 500 volunteers. Commanding General Winfield Scott would combine volunteer units with his regular army units to create three separate field ar armies. One, the Army of Occupation, the Army of the Center, your next slide, Mike, if you would, the Army of the Center, and the Army of the West, each with specific goals. The battalion would be attached to the Army of the West, the Army of the West was commanded by uh, Stephen uh, W. Carney. Uh, next slide, yeah. Mike. Okay. And they, he had three specific goals. First, capture and secure Santa Fe, New Mexico. Second, next. Okay. Next was to proceed west across the mountains and the desert of the southwest and capture, secure, and occupy the coastal towns of San Diego and Los Angeles, and third, to connect with the Navy Com Commodore John Sloat in Monterey Bay in California. Okay. You know, it may go faster if I could download your file. Too. Okay, why don't you try that, and then I'll, I'll just, yeah, just I'll keep, keep going. going. Okay, so they reached, they, they were organized. With the formation of the battalion, Captain Allen was promoted to a lieutenant colonel, and the battalion took up their line of march uh, on July 20th, 1846, from Council Bluffs, Iowa, where they were sworn in. During their march, a lot of the men became ill and um, with fever and because of lack of rations and living outdoors without any protection, uh, tents or anything, they became ill. One of them was Captain Allen himself. One of the Mormon volunteers died along the way and uh, was buried uh, along the, the trek. The battalion arrived at Fort Leavenworth on August 1 and were issued their gears. So I'm going to take a minute to explain the gear that they were issued. Now I told you earlier that the Mormons did not, were not issued uniforms. A lot of the volunteer units during the Mexican War did not have uniforms, one of which was the battalion. But they were issued accoutrements and weapons which they were told they could keep at the end of their enlistment. First one is a cartridge pouch they carried over their shoulder and then whoops wrong side this side and then they had they were issued a a bayonet and a scabbard and a, a for a belt okay which they wore over the right shoulder with the breast plate in the middle, which made for a nice target for the uh, <laughs> enemies. And now to secure this to their, to their hips and not have it flopping around whether they were marching or running, they were issued a white belt. And they were told to keep these white. Now can you imagine walking across the Arizona and New Mexico desert and no water and keep them white? So my guess is they probably weren't right when they got to California. That's just my thought. After they got there, they cleaned them up. Uh. Okay, so this kept them from flopping around. They had their own personal knives. Then they had 
issued a haversack in which they carried like daily rations and journals and whatever. And they wore this over this shoulder. Okay. Then they were issued a canteen which had about three or four pints of water in it. And if you're in the desert, this is a tin campaign, uh, canteen that's been painted. So can you imagine how hot that water would be after four or five hours in the desert when they could find water? So they had this on them. And then they were issued backpacks. Surely I might need your help with this, if you would. And they kept in here extra clothing, incidentals like shaving gears and things. So they had this on their back. Altogether, about 45 pounds of gear when their, when their muskets or their pouches were full. And this is how they started out. They were issued three different weapons. This is the main weapon that they had. This is an 1816 Springfield Flintlock musket, 69 caliber, so it shoots a ball the size of the end of my thumb. Smooth bore, not very accurate, but this weighs about nine and a half pounds. The bayonet's another pound or so. And this is how they started out <clears throat> marching from Fort Leavenworth. Now, the army said that they, if they pooled their money, and which they did, they bought a wagon and a team of oxen in which to place all this gear so they did not have to carry it all the way. But that was at their own expense. They also were issued uh, a tin plate, eating utensils, um, a camp kettle, and a skillet for each mess. And each mess was probably lined up with the, the tent. The tent held six men, so like six minutes to a mess. And they had to cook their own food, and uh, if rations were issued, then they would cook their rations. But they, a lot of times, once they started their march, they had to forage for themselves, and I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to leave the rest of this on. <clears throat> so that's what they look like marching to California. They're kind of nice outfit right now. By the time they got to California, it was pretty much an all in rags. Okay, so where are we at? Issued uh, next slide. The other two weapons that they used were the 1803 Springfield rifle, which was rifled and not a smooth bore, which were the same guns that were used by Lewis and Clark in 1803. They were very accurate. Um, and then the other one was the 1841 uh, rifle. These were just a few of these issued uh, to the men who are probably the best shots, or maybe the officers, because they're a little nicer than a musket. And these men were, if they had one of these rifles, they were, ish they were assigned to go out and hunt food for the rest of the, the group while they were on the march. Okay. Sorry, it doesn't look like it's anything. Okay. On August uh, 13, the battalion began their march from Fort Leavenworth to California with Mormon Senior Captain Jefferson Hunt as temporary, temporary commander. Allen was too sick to leave. He, by the time he got to Leavenworth, he was bedridden. And so he couldn't go. So the Mormon captain, it's up now, okay. He, he led it, Hunt led it, and uh, he would command until August 30th when regular Army officer Lieutenant Andrew Jackson Smith rode into the Mormon camp at Garden Grove, Kansas, and said, informed the battalion officers that he was, had been ordered to take command of the battalion. He was a regular army officer. Along with him was the army doctor, George B. Sanderson. If any of you know any Mormon history, he was referred to as Dr. Death, and that was because of the, his supposed way he treated the Mormons, but that's a whole different story. I think he got a raw deal, but I'll, that's another talk we might have sometime, Mike. Hmm? On his I'm sorry? Were the dependents on his yes, march? the dependents were with him. All the women, all the children were on the march with him. It's very unusual, okay? A lot of unusual things. So the, the Mormon officers held a meeting to discuss Smith's claim, and they said, okay, we'll turn command over to him because, again, he was a regular army officer, and he could get supplies for them along the way that the Mormons probably couldn't do. So they gave him the command, and Smith agreed to allow the Mormons to uphold uh, Captain Allen's promise to them that they could practice their faith, and they would not split the families up, that they would always all be together. 
As the battalion marched west, many of the men became even more ill due to poor diet and the strain of the march. The further west they traveled, the more the men became ill. Okay, next slide. You can get it up there, Mike. On September 15th, oh, go, go back, this one there. That one, okay, that one's up. Okay. On September, where am I going? September 15th, while they were camped at the junction of the Arkansas River and the Cimarron Cutoff, which would be right here, they, uh, uh, Smith got orders from Kearney that the battalion needed to be in Santa Fe by October 10th. Now, because of the condition of the men and all the women, Smith said, we're going, if, to make that, we're going to have to make a detour. They had planned to go to Ben's Fort, which is located right here, resupply because Kearney had set that up as a depot. But because of the, the, the short window to get to Santa Fe, they decided to cut across the Cimarron Cutoff, which is through Oklahoma Panhandle and north of uh, the Panhandle of Texas. How many of you have ever been through that area? Pretty dry, right? So Smith knew that if he was going to make it by the 10th, that he had to do some drastic changing of the battalion. Because if they didn't make it by the 10th, Carney said, you guys are going to be mustered out of service right in the middle of the desert and find your own way back home. So what he did is he took all the able-bodied men and he formed them into one unit. And then he left the women and the children. He planned to leave the women and the children and the sick who couldn't make that force march to come behind them when he wanted to get there in time. So while they were there, there was, um, there was another thing happened. Next slide. Okay, John Brown is up there. Now, this is not the John Brown of uh, Civil War fame. This is John Brown who was a member who, um, who lived in Mississippi. And he, well, he came into camp. And what, he, what happened with John Brown was that he was on his way back to Mississippi and back from where? He led a group from Mississippi, which is well, down here, up to the trailhead of the Oregon Trail in um, St. Joseph, uh, Missouri. And he was told by the church, go down to Mississippi, organize those families that are ready to go west, and meet us on the Oregon Trail. So they got up there in May. In Independence is where they started from. And they waited a week. Nobody showed. So they said, well, maybe they're ahead of us. So they, got, they started going west along the Oregon Trail. And, at, and by mid-July, they were in near Fort Laramie right here. And the, nobody had, they found out that there were no Mormons west of them. So this is late July. They, they found out the Mormons were still back here at Winter Quarters. So they didn't want to go all the way back to Winter Quarters and come out, so they met a guy named John Richards, who was a trapper. And he told them about a place down on the Arkansas River, the headwaters of the Arkansas, in what is now Pueblo, Colorado, that there was a small trading post there, and there were trappers there with their Hispanic and Indian wives, that they would probably be able to get corn and, and do some trading there. So they decided to, yeah, they would go down there. So Richards led them down the front range through Denver, what's now Denver, Colorado Springs, Greeley, into Pueblo. And they established a colony there. There were like 40, 43 people. And so when John, they, they built some cabins. John Brown got them all organized, organized the first branch of the church in Colorado, which all was temporary, and the first American settlement uh, west of the Rockies, or in the Rockies at that time. But he also organized it, and then he started back to Mississippi to get his own family. And in Ingalls, he encountered the battalion. And he told them about the, the colony at Pueblo. So Smith was going to send the women and the children to Ben's Fort, because that was the depot. But he said, well, it makes more sense to have them go with their own people. So he sent them, the, uh, I think, 20 women, um, and, uh, 
20, uh, 33, one woman, one, 10 women, uh, 11 men as escorts, 33 children to Pueblo. And they left uh, that camp on the Arkansas on September 16th under the command of a lieutenant, Mormon Lieutenant Nelson uh, Higgins, and they arrived at Pueblo on the 20th. And they, they were told to stay there until they got additional orders. Okay, next slide, Mike. Okay. Uh, Smith then continued on to Santa Fe, and with the first half of the battalion, they arrived there on October 9th, so they made the deadline. And uh, the remaining contingent of the battalion arrived there on the 12th. He then turned the command over of the battalion to, next slide, uh, Captain Philip St. George Cook, who informed the men of their new orders uh, that he had received from Kearney. The battalion was to proceed to California and on the way construct a new wagon road via the southern New Mexico and Arizona. He also assessed the condition of the, uh, the battalion and... Um, was not impressed by what he saw. This is what he wrote, quote, Enlisted too much by family, some were too old, some too feeble, and some too young. It was embarrassed by many women. It was undisciplined. It was worn by traveling on foot and marching from Nauvoo, Illinois. Their clothing was very scant. There was no money to pay them or clothing to issue. Their mules were utterly broken down. The quartermaster department was without funds, and its credit bad, and the mules were scarce, end quote. What's that? Everything, everything was rosy, you know. <laughs> okay. So at this point, Cook decides to send 91, of the 91 six soldiers, uh, or 91 soldiers, among them uh, 20 able-bodied, so they were the escort for 76 soldiers. Uh, Mormon Dr. McIntyre was there. 17 of the wives, two single women, and 10 children were sent to Pueblo under the command of Mormon Captain James Brown. Not the singer, James Brown, but uh, <laughs> James Brown's uh, detachment left Santa Fe on October 18, and they arrived at Pueblo on November 7. After separating these individuals, Cook, now a lieutenant colonel, resumed his march to California. When the battalion arrived near present-day truth or consequences, which is about right in here, he decided to send some more uh, individuals back to, um, to Pueblo. Uh, I think there was one woman, um, let's see, trying to figure out where one, there was one woman and about 54 more soldiers were sent back to Pueblo. And they arrived there in January of 1847. So they marched over the San, San Cristo Mountains in a blizzard. And a lot of them had really hard time. But they got there. When they arrived, there were 287 Mormons in this colony. Men, women, and children. It was, uh, it was the first overland part of the Mormon migration um, to, to get to the west. It preceded the Salt Lake contingent, which would arrived in Salt Lake in 1847 by a year. Um, so Cook, they were there. So once Cook separated them, the men rested for a while. And Cook left with the rest of the battalion out of Santa Fe on October 19th, 1847, with 397 officers, and only four women were left. Only four women made the entire trip to California. Okay, so the battalion followed the old Spanish trail south through Gaines Valley along the Rio Grande where it breaks off to the south. So they followed it down to here and then where it breaks off to the south, they started their trek across the Arizona New Mexico deserts. And um, as they marched, Cook divided the men up into two columns, the width of a wagon, so that they could, they could compact the soil as they walked along. And they also had, were tasked with moving rocks out of the way so that the wagons would not sink in the sand or roll over big rocks and break axles and things. So they did that. The men would frequently have to assist the tired draft animals with uh, pulling the wagons. No water, no food. They, um, in this manner, they cut the wagon road. Uh, once the battalion left Santa Fe, they were no longer supported by a quartermaster service, and the supplies issued at Santa Fe ran out quickly. 
So without quartermaster support, the battalion was forced to live off the harsh desert land. They traded buttons and things off their clothes for food. Um, to the people in small villages they passed, they ate mesquite seeds. They, um, well, next slide, Mike. I think you're a little ahead of us here. Yeah, yeah, hit, hit the next slide. See if we get. Go further. Um, let's see, yeah, we're, uh, you're, go back one. Go back one, can you go back one? Okay, there it is. It's coming up. They, one of the things that they, they didn't were, uh, lacked a lot was water. So they would march for days without water, and they would, they would draw water from wherever they could find it. Uh, one of the men writes about sucking water from a buffalo wallow that was full of urine and, and buffalo feces through a, through a straw, because that's all they had. Um, when they reached, in, I think in Tucson, they took over Tucson, they, uh, they broke into this... Uh, this church uh, basement that had a vat of wine, and they, uh, the bunch of them filled up on wine and, and brought it back. Because they, and so there was, it was a tough thing. Um, the clothes wore out from walking through cactus, and so they would replace the worn out clothes with the canvases of the wagons as the wagons uh, wore out. Their shoes wore out, they wrapped their feet in cloth, and they had this other thing, they had beef on the hoof that they took with them to butcher as for food. And when the beef gave out, they would butcher them. And if they didn't have any shoes, they would take, after the animal was butchered, and make a, a cut along the top of the fetlock and, and down the back. And they would pull that leather off of the, of the fetlock and the, above the hoof, and they would sew it up and make boots. So they, uh, they, they were in pretty bad shape. Um, the only time that they had to fire their weapons in self-defense during their march across the southwest was while they were camped near uh, Tombstone, Arizona. Here they were attacked by a herd of wild bulls. The engagement lasted about 20 minutes, um, leaving nine bulls and three mules dead and several wagons damaged. A couple men got, uh, got gored by bulls, but they did not die. The battalion reached the Pacific coast on... Um, January 29, 1847, having constructed approximately 444 miles of new road by hand, this road would have several benefits for the United States in the future. Next slide, Mike, please. Okay. This road, uh, the military would patrol this road and cut off the flow of Mexican commerce between the north and the south parts of the country. And they would also use this to continue uh, and patrol after the war ended. <clears throat> the road created a new route providing access to California during the winter months. The road became the route of the Butterfield Overland Stage Company. And the road became a main U.S. mail route between San Antonio, Texas, and San Diego, California. Um, this increased movement of uh, people and mail and commerce after the end of the war influenced the U.S. government's decision in 1854 to purchase the 30,000 square miles encompassing Arizona, known as the Gadsden Purchase, which added to part of the United States. Okay. All right. Um, next slide. Okay, that's got the list. Next one. Okay. When the battalion reached the Pacific Ocean, they had completed one of the longest unsupported infantry marches in U.S. Army history, covering over 1,600 miles in six months. And that's unsupported mostly by any uh, quartermaster. Upon reaching California, they discovered that it was pretty much under the control of the United States. However, the battalion found themselves in the middle of a power struggle over who the Amer who, which American was authorized to control California. President Polk, next slide. Okay, yeah. Uh, President Polk had given uh, Kearney the authority to be military governor over California. However, Commodore John Sloat, this guy right here, had landed in California uh, on July 7th, 1846, and claimed California for the United States, becoming the de facto authority there. On July 16th, he turned over his responsibilities to Robert Stockton, who's Commodore Robert Stockton, and then Sloat swelled, sailed away somewhere else. Uh, once in command, Stockton officially mustered in John C. Fremont, this guy here, who had been in California before, and he had a group of mountain men, and he was going up and down California 
taking over towns and cities under, I guess, the Bear Rebellion flag. Or, and uh, he, his, tech, his, his methods were not uh, very kind. And when uh, Stockton finally uh, got, recruited Fremont, he officially made them a battalion of riflemen in the U.S. Navy. And they continued to uh, occupy towns and enforce a strict form of dictatorial martial law. That alienated and angered many of the native Californians and did not ingratiate them to the United States. In September of 1846, Stockton divided California into two military districts uh, with uh, Arch uh, Gillespie over San Diego, Fremont over Los Angeles, and himself over the entire California. Carney arrived in California on December 2, 1846, and moved his men towards San Diego, where insurgents loyal to Mexico had forced Lieutenant Gillespie and his men onto a ship in the harbor there, and um, they were waiting offshore in the naval ship. So when Kearney arrived in San Diego, he joined with Gillespie and they engaged these insurgents near Los Angeles at a place called San Pasqual on December 6, 1846. The Americans, no Mormons involved, attacked the insurgents and after a short battle were succeeded in overpowering them, but with great loss to key American officers and many enlisted men, leaving Kearney's command less effective than it was before the battle. After the battle, Kearney informed Stockton of his orders from Polk that he, and not Stockton, was the authorized governor of California. Kearney then moved to Monterey and informed Fremont of Polk's orders. Both Stockton and Fremont refused to turn their men and government supplies over to Kearney and refused to disobey, or they continued to disobey his orders. Now, because of his, his uh, poor conditions of his troops, uh, Kearney couldn't do anything. And besides that, Fremont tried to incite a battle between the Mormons and the Missourians. The Mormons, already there was a lot of tensions between them. And so uh, Car uh, Kearney was at a loss. He couldn't enforce his order. And so once the, the Mormons uh, arrived in California, and then shortly after there was a unit from New York, he now had the military power to, to confront uh, Stockton and uh, Fremont. And they both finally uh, gave, gave over their authority and their men to, to Kearney, but Fremont continued to cause trouble. So Fremont, or uh, Kearney, I'm sorry, not Kearney, yeah, Kearney said, okay, I'm going to place you under uh, um, insubordinate, charge you with insubordination and escort you back to Fort Leavenworth to stand trial. Um, and so that's where he finally got his... Uh, his authority and his power to enforce that. And then they went into um, occupying California. Next, next slide, Mike. Got it. Okay, the detached duty, all right. Carney was ass assigned the battalion to provost duty at San Diego and Los Angeles. Their mission, to help reestablish and secure civil order and assist with the making improvements in the living conditions of the locals. The battalion fulfilled their assignment greatly. They rebuilt the infrastructure in both, both cities. They helped dig wells, uh, created irrigation and sanitation systems, some of which did not exist before they arrived. They made the first fired bricks in California ever and used them to build new government buildings. They protected local leaders who had supported the American occupation from those who were against the occupation. Uh, they defended rancheros against the Indian raids and they constructed Fort Moore just outside of Los Angeles. They, const uh, they fostered goodwill between the new American government and the locals, treating them with respect and demonstrating America's intent to protect their personal rights. U.S. commanders never received one complaint from the locals about the Mormons. Okay. Um, the only members of the battalion who would experience any combat occurred while they were in... Um, San Diego. Um, part of their duties, as I said, was to protect ranchers from attacks by Indians and um, bad guys. And so on May 8, 1847, um, there was a patrol sent out. Mormon members marched from Los Angeles um, under the command of Lieutenant Samuel Thompson in response to reports of Indian attacks on civilians. 
That evening, the patrol was attacked by Indians, and a two-hour engagement occurred, <coughs> resulting in the deaths of six Indians and injury to two battalion members. That was the only actual combat that they experienced. Okay. Um, when the citizens of Los Angeles learned that the Mormon battalion were going to be discharged soon, they petitioned the army to extend their tour of duty. Uh, newly appointed civilian governor Richard B. Mason made several attempts to get the Mormons to stay on for another year. On June 29, 1847, he sent a letter to Colonel John D. Stevenson, who had replaced Cook as the commander of California's Southern District, to make Mason aware of the good feelings that the citizens had towards the Mormons. Captain, Dan um, let's see, um, in the letter, uh, he wrote, quote, all persons at San Diego are anxious that the Mormons should remain there. They have a correct course of conduct, become very popular with the people, and by their industry have taught the inhabitants the value of having an American population among them. And if they continued, they will be of more value in reconciling the people to the change of government than a host of bayonets." End quote. Okay. While they were assembled, at Los Angeles on 16, July 16, uh, 1847, the battalion was inspected by Lieutenant Smith and said, you're dismissed. That was his entire speech to them. And so um, four days later, uh, Cap Mormon Captain Daniel Davis and Lieutenant Cyrus Canfield managed to muster in one company of 82 Mormons for another eight months of service. And they were called the Mormon Volunteers, and these guys did receive uniforms from the army and they would continue the battalion's uh, good works with the civilian population from them this next year. The next group that had a, was the, uh, part of the battalion was that in early May of 40, 1847, Kearney selected 15 battalion members to serve as an escort for his overland journey back to, Calif uh, back to Fort Leavenworth to submit his report and to attend Fremont's court-martial. <clears throat> Kearney left uh, Sutter's Fort which is up by Sacramento. Yeah. Okay, okay, it'll come. It's over here by Sacramento, California. And um, on June 21, um, in mid May, and on June 21, 1847, they reached Truckee Lake, where they found the remains of the Donner Party. Anybody here not know about the Donner Party? Yeah. So they, okay, they found the remains. Yeah, just keep that up there for a bit. They found the remains, so Carney said, Okay, I want you guys to bury whatever parts you can find and then burn the cabins. So they were among the first to find the remnants of the Donners and they, they took care of it. Then they uh, continued on to Fort Leavenworth, arriving there on August 23rd. Um, the battalion members each received $8.20 for their additional service. They were mustered out of the service. The horses were taken away from them and they started their walk back to, to Council Bluffs. Okay. The third remainder of the battalion, after their discharge, five members of the battalion chose to go directly back to Council Bluffs. So they had just walked from here down to here to Los Angeles. They got discharged, and then they turned around and walked all the way back to Council Bluffs. Uh, they walked approximately 4,000 miles in one and a half years. One of them, Abraham Huntsinker, Arrived in Council Bluffs, he learned that his wife had died and his young son didn't know him. <laughs> the next year, he walked to Salt Lake Valley. Okay. Now, the rest of the members who did not return, they, the, they decided to uh, divide into groups of tens and fifties and go north to California to Sutter's Fort and work a little bit and get some money. And then they planned to march over the Sierra Nevada, which are the mountains, uh, along the California Trail back to Council Bluffs. Okay, because they didn't know they, the Mormons were in Salt Lake yet. So they, they, they started up there, they, um, they started over the mountains above uh, Sutter's Fort, and they met Sam Brannan, who was a Mormon who was returning to California from a meeting with Brigham Young. <clears throat> he informed the men that the, uh, that the Saints had now settled in the Great Salt Lake. Um, and a few days later, they continued on. After a few days, they met Captain James Brown, who was the commander of the, of the colony at uh, Pueblo. 
And he was on his way to Sacramento to pick up Mormon battalion wages because the Mormon, he knew the Mormons had gone up there. And he showed the, the travelers a letter from Brigham Young that stated, unless you can support yourself with food and clothing, don't come to the valley. Things were really bad in the valley the first two years. And so if you can't support yourself, stay in California. If you don't have any family in the Salt Lake Valley, stay in California and work and get some funding. So a few men continued on with their families to, to Salt Lake. But then uh, the rest of them, there were 27 that went on to the Salt Lake. The rest of them turned around and went back to uh, Sacramento and San Francisco and Sutter's Fort to look for work. Now, I might mention in February of 1846, Sam Brannan loaded 281 Mormons on a ship and sailed around South America, oh, I'm sorry, Mike, and ended up here in San Francisco about a week after Sloat landed there and took possession of California. So there was a colony of Mormons in California at the same time. And so these Mormons went up there, the battalion members, to be with family and friends and look for work. So while they were up there, um, they... Um, they headed to, some of them headed, several headed uh, to, to uh, John Sutter's Fort. Okay, you got Sutter up there, all right. They arrived there, um, and they were looking for work. Now, Sutter said, yeah, I have some work for you guys. Can you, are any carpenters here? I need a, a lumber mill built, or sawmill built on the American River near Coloma. Um, and so, yeah, the Mormons went up there, and he hired a number of other non-Mormons to construct this sawmill. And uh, work began on the 17th of September of 1847 and progressed quickly until January of 1848 when the, uh, the foreman, James Marshall, discovered something that would impact the entire world. Now, one day, on that day of the 24th of January, Marshall was inspecting the mill race, which was the, the channel that they built to, def to, to redirect the water to the mill to run the mill. He looked down and saw something shiny. He picked it up, and it was gold. Two battalion members, Henry Bigler and uh, David uh, Ezra Smith, recorded the find in their journals. That's the only documented find at the start of the gold rush ever re anywhere. So they were there. Um, battalion members uh, who were working on the mill wrote to their friends in San Francisco about the gold. And in February, three former members of the battalion sh asked Sutter if they could go prospect on his land there. And he said, yeah, go ahead. So they went to this little island off, up near Coloma, and it was referred to as Mormon Island. And it was the second largest gold strike of the period, and called Mormon Island. And so the, the men, the battalion members, while they were finishing the mill, they worked on it at night. More members were coming in and uh, uh, prospecting. And so they were doing well. They finished the mill, and they decided that uh, it's time to go. But before they left, something happened. Uh, next slide, Mike. Um, it started a gold rush. You know, word got out to other people. And then people started coming in in droves. Um, then the first official news of the gold strike was relayed to the outside world through the um, Calif uh, the let's see, his California Star, I think is the name of the paper. Yeah, and this is a paper that was produced by Sam Brannan. And what he did is he held on to the papers, and then he hired uh, about six or seven Mormon battalion guys to deliver copies of the paper to the newspapers back east, which would start the big gold rush, which would tell the world about the gold. But what he did was before he sent these writers out, he bought up every pick, pan, shovel, and device that they could pan for gold in California in anticipation of the, of the gold rush. And Brandon did become the first millionaire in California, not from panning gold, but from mining the miners, okay, is a term they used, okay? So uh, the, the gold rush started. Um, next slide, Mike. Next one. Next one. Yeah. The Mormons were the only ones of the original construction crew who stayed on to finish the mill. Uh, after gold was discovered, the, uh, and the work, uh, they finished the work in March of 1848, and they uh, decided, well, it's time to go rejoin the saints. They were going to go up 
over the Truckee route. Okay, it's not up there yet. It's the Truckee runs through Reno, Sparks, Nevada, up to the north. But there was such heavy snow and rain, okay, uh, they were going to go up this way. But there was such heavy snow and rain that the trail along the Truckee, which they would have to cross probably a dozen times, was too high, too rapid, and too cold. So they decided to go south and find another route over, down over the Carson, down into Carson City way. And, but wagons had never been over that route before. So on June 21st, the men packed up their supplies and began their journey. Over the next month and a half, the men would create a new wagon route over the Sierra Nevada. Between August 1 and 4, using only hand tools, they constructed a road through seven miles of solid rock. Next, next slide, Mike. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Beyond that. Yeah, leave this one, leave this one. Okay, and, and so what they did is, to break up these big rocks, they built bonfires. And then the bonfires heated the rocks, the rocks cracked. They were able to pick them up, regrade it to wagon grade. And they did this for seven miles, creating a new over, uh, wagon road through the mountains. Um, <clears throat> after clearing the mountains, they dropped down into the Great Basin, traveled north, east along, across Nevada desert, along the Humboldt River, which is right here. And then on, um, let's see, on August 27th, they encountered a, a group of trappers going this way, about right here, just west of Elko, Nevada, a place called Biawawi Gravelly Ford. And he told them, about, he told the Mormons about a, a new road that he cut that would cut off eight days to ten days travel into the Salt Lake Valley. This is called the Salt Lake Cutoff, and it was located near the City of Rocks. And so the Mormons said, okay, we'll try that. So they got up there, they found the cutoff, but what happened was that there was a mule trail, and they, nobody had ever taken wagons there. So they said, okay, let's do it, and they made this, this route. And uh, this new route over the Sierra Nevada that they cut, and the uh, new cutoff, called the Salt Lake Cutoff, became major routes to the California Gold Rush field that had not existed before. Um, the, uh, because of their location in the, in the, along the California Trail, halfway between the United States and, um, and, and the Pacific Ocean, Salt Lake City became a primary resting spot for Overland travelers, non-Mormons. So um, as people stopped over, they spent money. One of the problems that the Mormons had when they first arrived in the valley, they had no money, no cash to buy supplies. So everything was in a barter system and they were struggling. The Mormon, when the Mormon battalions started coming back into the valley, the ones that had been in California, they brought with them gold dust. So they gave it to the church and the church set up a medium of exchange in which they measured out ounces of gold into brown envelopes, sealed them with a Brigham Young seal, signed them, and they used this as a medium of exchange for a while um, to buy goods amongst each other. And then finally, when enough gold dust was brought into the valley to um, in large enough quantities, the church minted their own coins. And I have samples of restrikes of these in different calibrations. And they were pure gold. Um, and so they were accepted among the Mormons, but the non-Mormons really, eh, I'm not sure about that. Until by the time all these overland travelers on the way to California spent tons and tons of money in, uh, in, in the Salt Lake Valley, they, there was enough U.S. coinage to go around, so they didn't need these coins anymore and they stopped producing them. Uh, there was, uh, between 1849 and, eight, almost done, Mike, 1851, there was um, about $70,000, 70 to $75,000 worth of gold dust put into coins. Brigham Young used the coins, uh, gold from the battalion and the overland immigrants, to fund a colonization program into the outer reaches of the Great Basin. Uh, many of those who were called to lead these colonization left efforts were Mormon battalion members. By the time Brigham Young died in 1877, there were only over 300 colonies had been established in the Great Basin, funded by the gold that they brought in. Next slide. Two, no, next one. Two cities, two new cities were created by the Mormons. 
were Las Vegas and San Bernardino. Uh, the road that connected these two cities over to the coast uh, became much of follows I-15 I today. So they cut that road. Next slide, Mike. Uh, beyond this one. Yeah, beyond that one, okay. In 1849, um, battalion members under Jefferson Hunt um, were going along this new road to California when several of them dropped out and um, decided to break off and find a shortcut. Their effort proved very just devastating because their new route uh, was dry and it was hot and there was no water and they almost all died. As a result, this area became known as Death Valley. Okay. <clears throat> if, next slide. Former battalion member Major Howard Egan served as a guide for James Simpson's uh, U.S. Army Topographical Corps in mapping out a new 300-mile route through the southern Nevada that would become <clears throat> a Pony Express route, an Overland Telegraph route, and a major route for the Army to protect the commerce between Fort Ruby in Nevada and Fort Churchill in western Nevada. U.S. Highway 50 now follows much of that uh, road today. In 1850, a uh, group of former battalion veterans were returning from California from the gold fields when the uh, seven of them dropped out just on the uh, base of the eastern side of the in the Sierra Nevadas and set up a small trading post. Next slide. That uh, <clears throat> became uh, just south of present-day Carson City. Uh, this was first referred to as Mormon Station it would later be called Genoa and be credited as one of the first, if not the first, settlement in uh, what is now the state of Nevada. Even though recruited from a single religious body as part of a political strategy and not for patriotic reasons, the uh, <clears throat> Mormon battalion was treated as a military unit, performed all its duties they were ordered to do, stood ready to face combat without hesitation, their behavior as provost unit was held in high esteem by the citizens under their military jurisdiction and also by the regular army officers who commanded them. As a result of their hard work and dutifully carrying out their orders, they contributed greatly to the transition of a newly acquired territory of California from Mexican to American governance. Little would these men realize when they volunteered that their experiences surviving in the harsh deserts of uh, the American Southwest and their association with Hispanic and California cultures would prepare them uh, as pioneer leaders for their fellow saints. The skills they acquired working with irrigation and adobe in California and agricultural products they discovered in these places would help the saints in the Salt Lake Valley to survive their first two years there. Uh, the trails they carved across America's desert, mountains, and plains within two years would be used by tens of thousands of people to cross the continent to the California gold mills and Pacific Ocean solidifying America's hold on California. Will Bagley, Western historian and author, capsulizes the role of Mormon battalions in the opening of the Trans-Mississippi West. He wrote, This battalion, perhaps the most unusual body of men ever to serve in America's armed forces, holds a singular place not only in the Western history, but also in a larger annuals of the Republic. Between 1846 and 1848, its members played pivotal roles in events of such magnitude that they continue to shape the nation's destiny and lives of its people. And quote, Will Bagley, Army of Israel, Mormon Battalion. That's the Mormon Battalion, one of the most unusual units ever to serve, and uh, little, probably one of the least known parts of American history of the West. Questions at this time? I know it was a long time. <laughs> Questions? Yes? I'm a coin collector. I'm curious, where do you get three strikes of those? You can get them from uh, the um, Church yeah, History Museum. Uh, Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. Just call them up and they'll send them. Uh, the question was, where can you get collector restrikes of the coins that the Mormons used? But those aren't actually gold. No, they're not gold. They're facsimiles. Yeah. If they were gold, they wouldn't have paid two ninety five for them. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, call up, uh, go online, Church History Museum, Art and History, go to the bookstore, and say they'll send them to you. Okay? Questions? Other questions about the battalion? Yes, in the back. Did they run into, on their journey, did they run into um, the Comanches or the Apaches? They never had any trouble with any Indians. <laughs> no trouble, but they, mm -hmm. they I don't know if they really encountered them, or they kind of stayed away from each other. Yeah. Other questions? That's all. Mike. 
Did the Mormon battalion continue to exist in some form as a military force as the Salt Lake? Okay, did everybody hear the question? Did they continue as a military unit afterwards? No. Once their duty was up, they were released from the army, but they were called upon to be leaders of these uh, colonization efforts. And uh, they worked with the army like Simpson and laying out roads. They were active as scouts. The next time they acted as a uh, military unit was in the Utah War in 1856, 57. What was that war? The Utah War. That was where the government said that there was a rebellion in, in Utah. Um, and they sent uh, a number of infantry in the winter time, if you will, to, to uh, su suppress the supposed rebellion. And that's an interesting thing, too, because there was no blood uh, shed at all. But the Mormons bogged down uh, the army uh, near Fort Bridger during the winter. They burned all their supplies, and guys were living in tents in sub-zero weather. Inter another interesting story about the Mormons. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that was common. We didn't just save that from one Italian. Or I would think a lot of people probably walked home or got out of the way, but they had any horses that they had, the army owned. So you're on your own, guy. But that, I mean, 4,000 miles in a year and a half. It's a lot of shooting. And then they turned around and walked out to uh, Salt Lake Valley. Yes. So they were allowed to keep their rifles at the end of the. Their accoutrements, their rifles, and stuff. But you couldn't keep the horses, too. What they didn't have horses. They, if they had horses. They, they had mules and oxen, right. and the men, the enlisted men, had to buy their own uh, if they wanted their own conveyances for their, uh, their equipment. And some of the, they had some issues with the sick riding in privately owned wagons during the march, which Lieutenant Smith and the Mormons butted heads over. But it was a different army. They had to buy their own stuff. They were buying their own food, trading buttons off their clothes just to buy food and things along the way. But they fulfilled their duty. Other questions. Great history. Great history. Other questions. Okay. I'll be up here to answer questions. Bob Mulder's got his, his firearms in the back room. That's worth a, a, a look-see. Bob's real knowledgeable about that. But I'll be up here. Also, um, for you, if uh, these are a list of the accomplishments of the Mormon Battalion with regards to the Settlement of the West, those will be up here as well and there for you to, to take home with you. So that's my, that's my program. I would encourage you. It's a great history. And next weekend, I will be down at Ben's Fort for their annual hot Christmas program, portraying one of the members of the Pueblo Mormons who were able to draw rations from the fort. So I'd invite you to come down for that, too. So thank you again, folks. I'll be up here. Sorry it took so long, Mike. I don't have a watch. Thank you so much, David. Yeah. In fact.